Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming today. My name is Alan Townsend. I have the pleasure of serving as the provost at CC. And I have been looking forward to today's event for a very long time. Uh, it's not often that you get to share a stage with two of your heroes. And that will be the case for me today. Um, I suspect most of you, um, I recognize that many of you are alums here, um, don't need an introduction to our two special guests today, but I'm going to move into one in a moment anyway. Um, but I'll just say this up front. Uh, if they're not heroes of yours as well, they should be. Uh, both of our guests today have not only had remarkable careers within their scientific arena, but have branched far, far beyond that to affect the state and the practice and the incorporation of science into policy in this country as a whole, and really have had a lot to do with setting forth the options and path that we still have as a society uh, to move towards a sustainable future. Uh, so let me jump in. I could easily take the rest of our time introducing both of them. I promise I won't or I'll be in trouble with them both. Um, but I want to take a little bit of time here. And I'm going to start um, with, with someone I've known for a long time who has been a, a mentor in my own career. Uh, Jane Lubchenco is currently the University Distinguished Professor at Oregon State University, where she spent a lot of her career. She is a, a marine ecologist with expertise in the ocean and climate change, interactions between the environment and human well-being, but honestly, that hardly begins to cover it. Jane served as the U.S. Undersecretary of Commerce for Oceans and Atmosphere and the Administrator of the National Ocean 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 Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, was an inaugural member of President Barack Obama's science team from 2009 to 2013. Um, she was the first woman to lead NOAA in that capacity. Um, after that, she then became the first U.S. State Department science envoy for the ocean, serving as a science diplomat to China, Indonesia, South Africa, Mauritius, and the Seychelles. She's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, the Royal Society, the World Academy of Science, the list goes on. She has a long, long list of awards, including 21 honorary doctorates, and the highest honors given by the National Academy of Sciences, the Public Welfare Medal, the National Science Foundation, the Vannevar Bush Award, as well as the Tyler Prize, the Heinz Award, and a MacArthur Fellowship. Jane co-founded three organizations that train scientists to be better communicators and engage more effectively with the public, policymakers, media, and industry including one that has a direct path for why I'm standing before you today, the Aldo Leopold Leadership Program. Uh, Jane received her PhD from Harvard and her master's from the University of Washington, but of course, most importantly, she got her undergraduate degree here at Colorado College. Please welcome Jane Lubchenco. <laughs> Our next guest, we don't just get one distinguished guest today, we get two. Marcia McNutt is a geophysicist and currently serves as the president of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, but like Jane, that's only a tip of the iceberg. Um, for four years prior to her current post, she served as the editor-in-chief of the science family of journals, and if you're not a scientist and aren't familiar with that, that's pretty much the most prestigious journal in the world. Uh, prior to joining science, she uh, was the director of the U.S. Geological Survey, or USGS. Uh, again, like Jane, the first woman to lead that agency in another part uh, of President Obama's transition and in an initial leadership team. Jane just let me know, too, before the introduction for the CC folks here, that I didn't realize that there were five CC members of that initial transition leadership team that came in, which is really quite astonishing for an institution to size. During Marsh's tenure, the USGS responded to a bunch of major disasters. Uh, she was quite busy, I guarantee you, including earthquakes in Haiti, Chile, Japan, and the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And she was awarded the US Coast Guard's Meritorious Service Medal as part of that work. Prior to joining the USGS, she served as President and Chief Executive Officer of MBARI, or the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, which is in Moss Landing, California. And during her time there, MBARI really did a number of remarkable things to advance our understanding of oceans and the way in which we can measure what they do. She began her career at MIT, where she was the E.A. Greswold Professor of Geophysics and directed the joint program in oceanography and applied ocean science and engineering. 
Marsha is also a member of the National Academy of Sciences, as I said, she's the president of it now, the American Philosophy, Philosophical Society, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She too holds multiple honorary degrees. And she was the recipient of the American Geophysical Union's prestigious McIlwain Medal and its Maurice Ewing Medal, and also served as president of that organization. Marsha got her PhD in her sciences from Scripps. As I said before, that's not really the important one. She's also a CC alum. Please welcome Marsha McCutt. So let me just take a moment and, and describe how this is going to go. And to be honest, I don't know exactly how it's going to go because we're going to have a conversation. But that's really what we're going to do. I'm going to sit down in a moment and just see where the conversation leads. Um, but we will leave time at the end, uh, I promise. You can shout if we're going too long um, so that all of you can have a chance to stand up and ask questions of your own of our guests today. There's a mic on either side of the aisle, and we have people who will help, who will help direct them when we get to that point. You run over here. Thank you both for being here today. It really is, um, I know both of your time is not easy to come by, and so we really, really appreciate it. Um, I, I want to start today, given where we are and the reason that we're here, just to talk a little bit about how you each ended up here at CC, what your path was. And um, maybe, Jane, I'll start with you. I know that you grew up in Denver, so I assume that was part of the path to the college. But how did you come here and then end up finding a love of oceans? When I was uh, in high school looking around at uh, potential schools, I really didn't have a very good idea of what I wanted to do. I knew I liked everything, uh, <laughs> and so I really thought that uh, a place that had lots of different options would be a really good fit for me. Uh, <clears throat> but the more I learned about CC, the more I, when I came up to visit, uh, I really uh, liked the students, I liked all the faculty that I met. Uh, but one thing that really attracted me at the time was they, this was a time of experimentation in higher education. And CC had decided to try something quite unconventional. They were going to have a class of students, a, a handful of students, uh, in what was a completely independent study program, uh, while the rest of the students in the same class were taking normal classes. And this was before the block plan, as all of you who are in my class of 69 know well. We were the last class that had regular classes the way most universities and colleges do. Uh, and that independent study program sounded like a really interesting idea. And I thrived in that program. I loved that program. Uh, we could take classes if we wanted. We could uh, do tutorials with faculty if we wanted. We could just go to the library and read if we wanted. Uh, we had no exams. We had no grades. Uh, and at the end of two years, we had to pass a very broad uh, exam covering all different fields and at the end of four years another broad exam but also one that was uh, your, whatever your area of specialty was. So I just really was drawn to the idea of an institution that had few students, uh, lots of faculty that were really into teaching and a very intimate relationship with, with students, faculty, students, you know, spending time together. Uh, and that feel that I uh, was attracted to turned out to be what happened when I was here. One of the, uh, I ended up uh, majoring in biology, and one of the professors in biology, uh, Dr. Alice Hamilton, uh, whom her friends affectionately called her Pinky, uh, Pinky uh, often just looked around at really good students and ones that she found that she thought really had potential she recommended they spend, uh, take a summer class at Woods Hole, Massachusetts, at the Marine Biological Laboratory, and uh, experience, uh, in, in, this was an invertebrate zoology course that I took. So as a Colorado kid uh, who grew up in the mountains, <clears throat> hiking and climbing and skiing and doing all those things, uh, I discovered there was this whole new world of biodiversity that I didn't know existed, and I just totally fell in love with the ocean hmm. and decided then that I wanted to go to graduate school and I wanted to do the ocean. So it was one of the many gifts that CC gave me, an opportunity to explore, 
to try something new, to learn to be curious about something that I didn't even know existed. And that was such a wonderful gift and uh, obviously has set the course for much of what I do now. Oh, that's cool. The no exams and no grades might be popular again. If you're talking <laughs> to students, I'm not sure. Well, except there's a lot <laughs> writing on the one, you know, the couple you do. <laughs> So my time at CC was so uh, special, uh, and I liked it so much, that uh, four of my five sisters came to CC after I did, so they got to experience the block plan. Two of them are with us here today, uh, but it's been really fun for us to share experiences of CC across the years. Thank you. And Marcia, you were not from Colorado. You grew up in Minnesota, I understand. So what, how did your sites get set on CC? Well, of course, it's not at all unusual to have people from Minnesota here at Colorado College. It's probably the second most populous state here at the college uh, because of hockey. So when I was looking at schools to apply to, I only applied to two. I applied to Stanford and I applied to Colorado College and I considered them to be completely equal schools in my estimation. When I got the uh, admission letters for both schools, Stanford said that the freshman class would meet in such and such stadium for orientation. <laughs> uh, Colorado College said that the freshman class would meet in Shove Chapel for orientation. And I said to myself, I would rather go to the school where the freshman class can meet in the chapel rather than the stadium. <laughs> So I accepted Colorado College and said no to Stanford. <laughs> Wise choice. So did you, you know, the, the college is justifiably well known for the geology department and the field work that's done here. Did you come here with an interest in the geosciences already in mind or did you develop it here? So, um, so it was interesting. I, um, the first course I took was John Lewis's uh, intro geology course. <laughs> Talk about an amazing, amazing class. Um, we, because we were the first class in the block plan, we rolled up our sleeping bags and packed up our backpacks and basically went out into the mountains for two months and didn't take any books, learned about geology from first principles by using our eyes and powers of observation to put together the history of the Front Range. Uh, it, was, it was truly uh, the best way to learn I could ever imagine. And so I did seriously consider uh, majoring in geology, but I had come here to major in physics and I really liked the rigor of physics. At that time, the faculty in the geology department um, still were of the thought that uh, all of Earth's processes uh, could be explained by vertical forces acting on the Earth. And it wasn't until Dick Hilt in the physics department um, handed me, um, when I was within a year of graduating, um, the very first Scientific American article that had ever been written on plate tectonics by uh, a professor by the name of John Dewey. And I read that article and it changed my life because here was the rigor that I had been missing in geology that was applied to earth problems. And I remember this vision in my mind of there was like an elevator door that was opening in front of me with a sign flashing up, up. And all I had to do was step onto that elevator because here was a new paradigm for the geosciences that was just being understood. And I could get in on the ground floor of it and ride that elevator up. So it would be like going into um, biology right after Darwin um, proposes the um, uh, the um, natural selection, or it would be like going into physics right after Einstein publishes special relativity. 
This was my opportunity to get in on the ground floor of a scientific revolution, and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't miss it. So I stopped everything I was doing and decided, I completed my major in physics, but I started applying to geoscience programs for graduate school. And that's at the advantage of a school like Colorado College. You have a caring professor like Dick Hilt, who took me aside and gave me that article and knew it would change my life. And are the rumors true? I, I learned recently that we may share something in common, which is that prior to Dick doing that, you also had the plan to skip out on grad school at the beginning and become a ski bum? <laughs> yes, yes. So uh, Dick asked me what I was going to do after I graduated, and I told him I was going to take a year off to be a ski bum with my best friend, and we were going to go to uh, Sun Valley and be um, bartenders at night and ski during the day. And he, he painted this picture for me of how in three years I would be married to a um, uh, ski patrolman named Sven and I would be out there, um, you know, um, putting uh, clothes on the line with little children around my feet wondering what happened to all my dreams. And he instead handed me an application for a National Science Foundation graduate fellowship and he said, fill this out. You will get this. You will go to graduate school now. <laughs> <laughs> I had a somewhat similar experience being talked out of the same kind of plan. Um, I, I want to change the tone a, a little bit for a moment and, and stay with you, Marcia. I know that we, we share something else in common, which is a lot less fun. Um, the loss of a spouse with a, with a young child at home, which I know happened early in your career. And, and the only reason I bring it up is that, you know, I'd love for a moment for you to talk about how, how did you grow a leading edge scientific career in the way you did at a time when women faced even greater professional challenges in STEM than they do today? Um, what was it that allowed you to do that? What did you learn from that? Well, um so that was a really uh, tough period. I have to say that I got some really, really good advice from uh, someone in my department. I was on the faculty at MIT at the time. And um, one of my colleagues told me, try to change as little as possible in your life because you're coping with so much grief right now, and you're going to have so much to deal with, you know, try not to move from your home because you've got young children and they need to know that life hasn't suddenly everything changed. And it was really, really good advice. So um, I, you know, I had offers at that time to go teach at other places, which I thought might be, you know, less uh, intense than staying at MIT, but I decided, no, I would stay at MIT. And that advice was actually the best advice I got because I got a lot of support from the university and a lot of support from my colleagues there. Thank you. Jane, I know that, um, so for those that don't know, um, Jane's husband, Bruce, is also a very leading ecologist as well, and that the two of you, had some struggles and challenges early in your career too to figure out how to make that work. For many of us in academia experience a two-body problem, but yep. at a time when that was rare or mm -hmm. not thought about very much, and that also the, the obvious one of trying to balance building two professional lives and, and raising a family. Um, and you came up with a kind of creative solution that you tried and opened some doors. Can you talk about that? Sure. Um, let me uh, paint the picture, uh, and those of you who uh, are my age will sort of remember this, but for those of you who aren't, um, there were uh, many women in uh, science uh, as undergrads, but fewer and fewer in, uh, you know, when, in graduate school, and then next to none at, on the faculties. And I remember very vividly um, when I uh, had my orientation for the incoming class of uh, graduate students at Harvard University. And the person who welcomed us 
uh, sat the class down and said to everyone, uh, I want to tell you that this is a very special year for Harvard University Department of Biology. He said, look around you. You will notice that half of the room are men and half are women. He said, we are really excited uh, about this. This is, this is a milestone for us. And I want you to understand why this has come about. He said, we have learned from painful experience that the men graduate students in the department have not been happy if they didn't have women in their classes. And then he said, now, we don't expect all of you to finish, dot, 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 but we welcome you anyway. Welcome to Harvard. And I thought, what planet am I on? <laughs> You know, I had grown up with five sisters. We had parents who empowered us and told us we could do, you know, whatever we wanted. And I had had these phenomenal experiences uh, here at CC. And uh, so this was just another world. And I thought, you know, I don't care what he's saying. You know, this, uh, this that, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm staying. Thank you very much. I'm staying. I'm going to pro prove him wrong. And quite a few times, I've been motivated to prove somebody wrong when you know, you've been in a situation like that. I'm sure that Marsha's had a similar situation. So I went on, I did my PhD in three years. Uh, I was on the faculty at Harvard uh, after that for a couple of years. And my husband, Bruce, was on the faculty at the University of Massachusetts at Boston. And we began thinking about maybe it was time for us to start thinking about having a family. And we couldn't imagine carving out the time to do that because we spent so much time doing our field work we we're both marine ecologists, spending a lot of time on the rocky seashore. We loved teaching. We both loved it. We wanted to both continue doing that. And all of, the, all of our friends and all of our predecessors who had been in similar situation, the guy had taken, uh, would take an academic job, and the woman would uh, start uh, having children, and then be the, the caretaker would stay home and never be able to get back into academia. And so that was just sort of the way the world worked then. And we said, that's not what we want. We both want to be faculty members. We both want to be able to do this. And we both had had um, mothers. Uh, my mom was a pediatrician. And she had worked part time when all of us were little because she thought it was important to spend time with us. And Bruce and I both thought it was important for both of us to spend a lot of time with the kids we uh, thought we would have. So we started thinking about how could we do all the things that we want to do together and ended up suggesting to a variety of universities where we applied for positions that they take a single job and split it into two separate half-time but tenure-track positions. And that had never been done. And so we talked to a number of universities about that and they said, oh, weird, you know, why would we do that? <laughs> Or what do we do if we get divorced? Or what do we do about tenure? Or you know, how do we evaluate you? You know, all these reasons not to do it. Uh, and Oregon State University really, really, really wanted us. And uh, they had a very, so the department wanted us. The dean at the, at the college was very open-minded and willing to think about something non-traditional. So he said, sounds good to me, let's try it. Let's think through all the things and how we're gonna structure this. So we didn't share a position. They were two separate positions so that each of us was evaluated on our own merits. Mm -hmm. And we had half-time teaching loads, half-time uh, other committee assignments and things. And so we went, that's why we went to Oregon State University. That reason, because there were really good faculty there and because there were rocky seashores that were phenomenal that were pretty much unexplored. So great research opportunities. And we did that for 10 years. Um, had uh, our two kids. By the time they were 10 and 13, we were ready to go back to full time. Uh, and that was uh, just a phenomenal way to balance family and uh, career for both of us in ways that now uh, there are thousands of positions like this around the US. But more importantly, there are much better childcare opportunities today than there were back then. That was just not really an option. Either you stayed home and took care of your own kids, or uh, you know, you, there, there, there wasn't an or. Yeah. So there are better options now. And so, but <clears throat> I mean, uh, Oregon State has quite a few other split positions like ours, as do a number of other universities and colleges. 
uh, and that worked well for us. And I think one of the reasons that we are both still really active in research and still doing a lot of other things is that we didn't get burned out trying to you know, do more than was humanly possible. Yeah. So we're really grateful for that opportunity, but also the, the role model that we had in, um, in my mom who did this balancing at a time when it was even harder for women. I might challenge you on the not doing more than humanly possible, but we could talk about that another <laughs> time. Um, so I, I, I want to, with both of you, we could stay on this general topic just for a moment. Um, both of you have been incredible role models for women in science um, in a number of ways and mentors to, to so many that I know. Um, but as you both know very well, um, while we've come a long way, we have a long way to go. We're not where we need to be. And Marcia, I know that you've been directly involved in work at the National Academies lately for addressing this issue head on, um, producing a recent report that showed pretty starkly that the environment within academia, within the sciences, is not at the level that it needs to be in terms of being equitable on a number of fronts. Um, can both of you comment for a moment on what you think the most important thing institutions like ours need to do to keep moving the work forward? Okay. Right, so um, what the report from the National Academy showed was that for the generation that Jane and I represent, there, was, there were gender inequities and there were uh, barriers to women's advancement. But for the most part, they were in our face. They were like the story Jane told, where you couldn't miss the fact that people were telling you right to your face that they expected you to fail. And so it was almost easy for us to see, okay, avoid that person, go around him, do whatever you needed to do to succeed. What the report from the National Academy showed was that for uh, now more recent generations, there are still barriers for them, but they have gone underground. And so because they aren't so in your face, it's much harder for young women today to know how to avoid them, how to navigate them. It is actually illegal to discriminate. And so for that reason, people are not overt about doing it. So what the report says is that we actually have to change the culture of institutions. We have to change the culture from the top down and from the bottom up. And that takes a wholehearted commitment from leaders to make sure that they are signaling in every way possible through who they hire, through their policies, through um, their procedures, through everything they do that harassment will not be tolerated, that discrimination will not be tolerated, that they um, welcome diversity and that they support it. Thank you. So I'm not sure what more I can add uh, to what Marcia said other than uh, the fact that, uh, you know, the landscape has changed. There are a lot of things that have improved significantly. Uh, but, but as you said, we still have a long way to go. Uh, I think there is still, uh, there are so many messages that society sends to young girls that you cannot do this. You know, this is, you know, this is what society expects of you. And the same is true of, uh, you know, it's, it, it, as bad as it has been for women in science, it's even more challenging for people of color. And <clears throat> there are, uh, there need to be more opportunities and more well, more environments that feel welcoming, not just think they are, but that are actually felt to be welcoming. And many institutions are really struggling with how to do that. Thank you. Let's, let's maybe turn for a moment to, towards the title of our session, which I believe had the word, the liberal arts advantage in it. Mm. And one, of the, one of the reasons for setting this up in the first point today was um, 
as, as you look back um, for each of you, what was it about a liberal arts education in a place like this that set you up for the careers that you had? I know there are unique CC things, but, but I'd love for you to comment even beyond CC, just that this approach to doing higher education, what, what did you see as being critical to your success? So I think that um, both the fact that, so I can only speak from CC's experience, but having a small student body as well as liberal arts education means that you come in contact all the time as a student with students in other um, disciplines. Uh, you are expected to take classes and be fluent in other disciplines. You interact with faculty that are in a wide variety of disciplines. And I think that that cross-pollination, uh, both the formal and the informal, and the exposure, you know, the the just informal conversations that you have with people uh, are much less canalized in terms of a specific interest, but are broader and more general. And I think that's a really healthy thing. I think there's also more of a conscious effort to think about how all the different ways of knowing intersect with one another and how they enrich one another. And both to be human, but also to understand our world, I believe requires that breadth of understanding. You know, just a scientific view of the world doesn't begin to do it justice. And just a humanist view of the world misses all this incredible phenomenal richness that the sciences give. And so an opportunity to have this cross-pollination uh, is, is really, I think, important. When I, when I went to NOAA, when I was nominated to be administrator, um, it's fairly unusual for academics like Marcia and myself to be asked to come have key roles in, uh, in policy and management. And I, neither of us was naive with respect to how the government works because being president of AGU, of AAAS, other things, we had been in and around politics. I had worked with a lot of members of Congress. Nonetheless, I used to joke with my students that uh, my training as a marine biologist was actually perfect training for the rough and tumble world of politics because I already knew how to swim with sharks. <laughs> <laughs> and more to, to, to bring that back to the point I was just making, uh, a lot of what happens in politics is about human behavior. And a lot of the communication that happens in Washington is not just verbal communication, it's nonverbal communication. And when you dive with sharks, you learn to read animal behavior. And when you study animal behavior as a topic, you learn about all these forms of communication. And so you are sensitized to that. And so using that knowledge that I had from biology to be able to read the signs of when a member of Congress is saying something, whom are they with? Where are they? What is the body language? That gives you incredible insight and so much of what happens in DC is about relationships. And that's part of what's broken down in recent times, that the relationships have uh, gotten so focused on party and less on, you know, we're here to be working together for the good of the country. But those relationships matter and that kind of communication matters. And so I think that's just a very specific example of how connecting the dots, you know, things that I learned as a student have come back to be useful in ways that I never anticipated would be the case. Mm -hmm. And that's partly what I think a liberal arts education does, is allow you to connect the dots across all these different fields and to think in a more holistic fashion. Um, as an ecologist, I think holistically. I think about relationships. I think about 
uh, how things fit together, not how do you take them apart, but how do you put them together, and how the whole is so much greater than the sum of the parts. But that, I think, is born in part of the learning to be curious, the learning to be respectful of other ways of knowing, the ability to learn and to listen and to uh, exchange and be able to uh, have uh, arguments and debate about things. That's all part of you know, what, what a liberal arts education is about. And I'm just so grateful that it was what I had. So I'd say from my perspective, the first time in my career when I really recognized the value of my liberal arts education was when I left my position at MIT and took up my first leadership position at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute in California. Now, at MIT, talk about a place where you can be totally comfortable being a science nerd and no one will think you're weird. You know, you could be totally lost in equations and data and computers and everyone will think you fit in beautifully. But once I got out to California, I recognized that I had to pull in a whole new skill set. I was not going to get any funding from my institution if I couldn't sell what we were doing at the institution to the Packard Foundation's board of directors, because that's the organization that funded me. And the board of directors from the Packard Foundation had their own set of priorities. They were funding children and families. They were funding conservation. They were funding all sorts of, uh, uh, a whole um, suite of projects. And I had to make what we were doing relevant to their priorities. So as Jean said, I had to learn to not only understand where they were coming from, but I had to be able to communicate with them. And then as a leader, I also had to be able to motivate the people who worked for me. And motivating people, you can't just, you know, write down equations or show them data. You have to get them excited about what could be with the dreams that you have for that organization. And that's a completely different skill set. To paint them a picture of the world not as it is, but the world as it could be if only we all work together as a team. So these are all things that come out of the liberal arts type of training that aren't just, you know, gathering data and solving equations and using inference. And so um, I really look back on the liberal arts training here and realize how much I benefited from the formal classes and from all of my fellow classmates that I interacted with. Thank you. I think you've both, in some ways, just answered my next follow-up question on it, but I, but I still wanted to bring this up and maybe have a little further commentary as necessary, that as you both know, um, you know, liberal arts in general have taken some hits lately in terms of the perception within the country, in terms of some of the portrayal, in terms of, you know, in some ways a, uh, a push for a, for a lack of a better term, almost a more utilitarian path is how it's laid out. Um, you know, for me, coming here recently, one of the things that motivated me to do so is that, is that I have a feeling with what we're facing in society today that it's never been more important mm -hmm. for some of the reasons you said. Um, do you find this coming up in, in your circles today? Do you find the need to kind of push back and, and advertise the importance of the background that you have? I don't know. Or not? I, I certainly do that with my students that you know, they, they, I, I don't teach at a liberal arts school, and yet I think the humanities and uh, you know, the, the, the other, you know, the, the social sciences, uh, you know, I think students need to be well-rounded to be both responsible citizens as well as um, complete human beings, as well as effective in their jobs. And I think they are much, so many employers are telling universities these days that the students that they hire, science students, don't have the full range of skill sets that they need because they don't know how to work in teams. 
They don't know how to write or communicate verbally. Um, they don't have the, what are often called softer skills that they are looking for uh, as, you know, that's, that's, what, that's where the world is going in terms of a lot of industries and they need that, that not just the technical training, but, but the other kinds of things that you get from having a much broader, uh, deeper background in, in a range of fields. And I'd say also um, that, you know, surely um, we still need people studying science and engineering. But um, what I also say is that the advantage of a liberal arts education is that it teaches people to think. And it teaches students how to learn. And whereas my father's generation, it was possible for someone to go to college once, learn one thing, and do that for the rest of their lives. That's not true with today's students. They will probably have five different careers by the time they eventually retire because technology in society is moving so fast that you can't expect a skill set, an applicable skill set, which is what people are you know, talking about acquiring in school, will be relevant for your working lifetime. And if you haven't learned how to learn, you are going to find yourself replaced by AI and automation. And so it's only by learning how to think and learn that you are going to find yourself with valuable skills that will never go out of date. Thanks. I, Jane, you mentioned a moment ago teaching your students to be good citizens. Um, I wanted to spend a little bit of time today kind of pulling that even wider and that, that you know, both of you have often also obviously taken a path through science that has jumped well beyond the lab or the field and the results there to um, connect science very broadly um, to an engaged citizenry. And I know, Jane, I remember first hearing you talk about a social contract for science more than 20 years ago when I was still a graduate student. Um, and you've both spoken very forcefully about the need to do that. Um, can you both expand on that a little bit more? How, how you see where we are today in terms of the responsibilities of an engaged citizenry and the role of science within that? So I think science is just so relevant to our lives uh, and it's more relevant now than it's ever been. Uh, and Yet, um, I'll, there's this huge disconnect often between what scientists know about a particular topic and what the public knows about a topic or policymakers. And it used to be the case that the model that we grew up with, which was scientists discover new things, they publish it in the peer reviewed literature. It eventually makes its way into textbooks and common understanding and policy. And that path is a relatively slow and indirect and diffuse one. The world is moving at such a rapid pace that that just doesn't work anymore. And there is so much need to share knowledge more rapidly once it has been discovered. And it's not just facts, it's actually, you know, and science is always evolving because we're always discovering new things. But to get that information out in ways that can enable people to use it to make smarter decisions is incredibly important. And so when I was proposing the new social contract for science, it was predicated on the assumption that scientists needed, or scientists had an obligation to do more than just discover and publish, that they really also had an obligation to share what they know with society, with humility, with transparency, with honesty, uh, you know, how certain of it are we, et cetera. But to do that in a way that is much more getting out of the ivory tower and engaging with society, making science more accessible, more understandable, more relevant and usable. And having worked with lots and lots of members of Congress, I can tell you a lot of them are very hungry for information, but 
they don't know where to go and they can't, they don't read the scientific literature. They have no idea what all this gobbledygook is that's published in papers. It's just all this techno babble. And so, you know, somebody has to be doing that, not just translation, but explanation and engagement because policymakers and citizens, people in business and industry will ask questions and give scientists new ideas. And so it's actually a two-way, very rich conversation. And I am so delighted that more and more scientists are doing that today. Students are demanding it. Students are saying, okay, you know, and there is much more open engagement with society. The academic institutions haven't really caught up with that because when faculty at most institutions are evaluated for promotion and tenure, that focuses on your teaching ability and your ability to get grants and publish papers. And it doesn't sufficiently value the importance of engaging with society, communicating to non-scientific audiences, engaging uh, with society, doing projects with local communities, et cetera. That's just not valued and it needs to be. So we need to change the reward system in academia not to make it a requirement that all academic scientists do that, but to make it, make the community value those who do. And so there's a bit of a disconnect there. But I think it is, people have been doing it despite the system. You've done it despite the system. A lot of your colleagues have done it despite the system. And I think that's incredibly powerful and very much needed especially when it comes time to really serious challenges that the world is facing, you know, environmental challenges, but social challenges, there are so many things. Science doesn't have all the answers, uh, but it has some useful information that people should have available, and then they can decide whether it's useful in making decisions. So whether decisions are made by individuals or by institutions, I think they will be better decisions if they're at least informed by the full range of information that's relevant to that decision. And right now, science is often, too often, not at the table because it's not available, it's not understandable, it's not accessible, it's not obvious how it's relevant. And so we need even more of that. We need the academic institutions to be more helpful to that. Yeah. So let me just give a specific example of what Jane was talking about. Almost all big cities have transportation problems. They have growing numbers of cars on the road and congestion. People can't get where they need to go in a reasonable amount of time. So what do the citizens do about it? Uh, do they put in subways? Do they put in light rail? Um, do they uh, have more ride sharing services? And um, have, uh, do they meter cars on roads and have uh, such that you have to pay for it? All of these are, are options that they could do, but um, all of them have impacts, all of them have carbon footprints, all of them have costs. And unless science is factored into it, you don't even know how can you build a subway unless you know the geology and whether you can even put something underground and um, whether it will be safe from earthquakes and things like that. Um, uh, putting in a light rail system, um, that comes at the expense of private property. Um, and all of these are then decisions where the science has to intersect with what values are. What are the values of the community? Do they value the benefit for the community over private property? Or is the benefit of uh, the whole community more important? And what are the various costs? The cost now versus the long-term cost of congestion. And is reducing the carbon footprint really important given the growing concerns about climate change? So this is a case where having the science available so that people can make informed decisions on how to deal with traffic congestion is a perfect example of informed citizenry making good choices. Thank you, and, and I'm glad you mentioned you got to one of my next questions, which is about our structures within academia lining up for that. Is, mm -hmm. 
many of us have pushed on that for a long time, but mm -hmm. I agree we've been slow. Um, and maybe just quickly, are you, are you seeing examples of any institutions that are, that are getting themselves on the leading edge? Um, I know when I was at Duke, before I left, we were starting a conversation about how to actually require and incentivize that kind of engagement as one path, but, but it wasn't implemented. Are you seeing that happen? So yeah, there are a number of institutions. Uh, and uh, interestingly enough, uh, the program that you participated in, the Leopold Leadership Program, many of the institutions that are doing that are folks who are Leopold Leadership mm -hmm. Fellows, which is nice. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so for example, um, University of Washington has been doing some very innovative things. University of Michigan, they actually had a university-wide discussion about uh, how much engagement faculty across the board, not just science, all faculty should do. Sh should they be stay in their ivory towers, do their teaching, do whatever else they do, or should they be actually engaging more with society? It was a very rich, vigorous discussion, and they said, how much do we expect? They did a survey of the entire um, faculty and then had a, a rich set of discussions about, okay, what does that mean? How can we have that be happening? And it's a huge challenge for academic institutions because there are more and more pressures on institutions. More and more demand for more classes, uh, more demand for more online teaching, more demand, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, the, the, the business model for higher education is really under stress right now. Uh, and so there are more demands, and then to be saying, well, instead of doing more, faculty need to be, in, instead of just doing more teaching in their classroom, they need to be doing more engagement with society. The, the faculty who want to do it are saying, how in the world can I do that juggling? And so it's a huge challenge to sort of the, 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 whole, um, the, the whole operations and the whole direction that higher ed is going, and yet I think it really needs to happen. So those institutions that are doing it, they're smaller scale examples. The Bren School at UC Santa Barbara is doing some phenomenal things. And they've just sort of said, despite what the system is, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna pioneer some new models and we're gonna break the mold and we're going to encourage this, and, and they've just moved ahead doing that. So I think there are a lot of lessons that are bubbling up that we can look to and learn from. Um, liberal arts schools have traditionally done a lot more engagement with local communities than have universities. <clears throat> so I think there are different, um, different types of pressures on small liberal arts schools than on uh, big, uh, universities that uh, so you know they but they but they both need to be having these discussions the only thing i'll add is the national academies is launching a new study to look at what could be uh, broader criteria for promotion and tenure at universities beyond just the narrow uh, peer review publications which are being used today. And some of the things that we are looking into are um, communication, public engagement, and also open science practices. The extent to which uh, scientists are making their data, their code, their methods, um, their reagents and other materials uh, available openly to other scientists to um, further um, their work as well. You know, I mentioned uh, that it was an exciting time in higher education when we were here at CC because it was just this time of social ferment and disruption, but there was a loss, lot of innovation, which is what birthed the block program. But I think we're seeing a comparable time of innovation because of disruption and because of new social challenges, new environmental challenges. And so it's actually, um, some people think it's a very depressing time. I actually think it's a very exciting time. It's a time for action. It's a time for innovation. It's a time for doing things that could not be done otherwise. And it, for those who are willing to be big and bold, I think it's a huge opportunity. I agree. I'm glad you said that. We're having exactly those conversations right now mm -hmm. here. Um, I, I want to, while we have some time left, I have a little bit before we can get to questions. I, I want to give each of you a chance to, to talk a little bit about the things you're doing now. 
Um, and um, maybe Norsh, I'll start with you. I mean, we've brought up the Academy a couple of times, but um, you've been in the leadership role now for three years, is that right? Yeah, and so um, maybe reflect a little bit on what you're seeing and what, what you see, not only as the important role of the Academy, but, but where you'd like to take it. So for those who don't know what the National Academy does, which is probably everyone here, <laughs> Um, the National Academy of Sciences was actually founded by Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War. And at that time, uh, there was the battle between the Monitor and the Merrimack. And they fought to a draw in Chesapeake Bay. Neither could sink the other because they were the first two ironclad warships. And it dawned on Lincoln, who was a pretty smart guy, that Technology was the secret in the future to winning the battle space, and he wanted the scientists on his side. So as Congress was going into recess, he got a bill through Congress to establish the National Academy of Sciences that would be a non-governmental, non-profit organization that would be <clears throat> membership of, of the elite scientists of the country that would be advisors to government. And they would be the government's think tank. We sort of think of ourselves as the Supreme Court of Science. Who do you go to when you have a legal issue that people don't agree on? You go to the Supreme Court. Who do you go to when you have a, a science debate? You go to the National Academy of Sciences. We decide when there's disagreement on science on what the consensus is. So we do about 200 reports a year that decide what the science consensus is on things like um, how safe are e-cigarettes or um, uh, whether certain chemicals are safe in the environment or what is their effect on humans, things like that. So um, right now is actually kind of an interesting time for the Academy because the federal government has actually disbanded um, many of the science advisory groups within the federal agencies. So the National Academy of Sciences is about the only show in town if you want to get any credible science advice. So we have about as much work as we've ever had um, because uh, it's, it's the one place you can go to get an unbiased, credible uh, piece of science advice. So there's a lot of work going on on the opioid crisis, on um, ocean work, on um, chemicals in the environment, on cybersecurity, how are we going to vote in the next election? And can you be sure that your vote is going to count and is going to be counted in the way you intended it to be? Um, so there are um, uh, quantum computing. Is that going to be on the horizon? What difference is that going to make? AI, how will that impact your jobs and your lives? How is AI going to uh, change education? How is it going to change health care? Um, what differences are new therapies going to make in healthcare? It's a very exciting time for science and a very exciting time for the academy. Thank you. So maybe I'll move. Well, let's do this. So, so, Jane, you've obviously been involved in ocean sciences from the beginning of your career. Um, but a lot is happening right now, mm -hmm. right? We, um, we saw the release of the latest. IPCC report uh, earlier this fall on the oceans and the cryosphere that didn't have very much good news in it from the physical science side, promoting a lot of attention. But you've been very involved, not only before, but of late, and, and I guess I would say trying to reframe a bit how we, as a society, look at the oceans, look at um, what the dangers are, but what the potential is as well. Can you, can you talk a little bit about the work you're doing there and how we're seeing that? Sure. Um, I do a lot of work at the intersection between the ocean and climate change and just human use and human impacts and uh, have for quite some time. Uh, and I think that 
uh, we're seeing the evolution of a new narrative around the ocean. Um, for most of human history, the ocean was seen as being so vast, just, just so immense, so bountiful, so resilient. You know, when, when we were here in, uh, at CC and in the 60s, uh, there was increasing uh, concern about pollution and the mantra was, dilution is the solution to pollution. You guys remember that? <laughs> Uh, so who could imagine a better place to diffuse stuff than in the ocean, you know, the, all this potential. Uh, so, but it, it was immensely bountiful, immensely resilient, and we sort of assumed it was infinitely so. And so that for most of human history, the ocean has been thought of as simply too big to fail. Uh, <clears throat> in the last decade, maybe decade and a half, We've seen in so many different ways how that is just no longer the case. You know, we're seeing this really graphic, disgusting images of this massive plastic pollution. We see these images of all the bleaching in the northern Great Barrier Reef. We're seeing uh, the impacts of, of warming ocean elsewhere, not just the Great Barrier Reef, but bleaching in other parts of the world. We hear reports of a lot of fishery crashes around the world. So every time you turn around, we're seeing more and more problems driven by practices on land, like our uh, use of energy uh, and the way we produce energy, causing climate change, and then of course, not only warming in the ocean, but the oceans are becoming more acidic because they, as they absorb the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, there are chemical changes in the ocean that make it more acidic, and that makes it harder for anything that has a shell or a skeleton to make those hard parts. So corals or mussels or clams, oysters, crabs, lobsters uh, are all increasingly challenged with ocean acidification. We're seeing, um, so climate change, we're seeing the fisheries, we're seeing um, so many problems that people are actually saying, this is just, there, there's no hope for the ocean. It is, it, it's, it's, it's doomed. It, it, there's no way we can fix all these problems. The drivers are so complicated, uh, so, so difficult to change. It's, it, the ocean is simply too big to fix. And I think that has sort of taken on a new um, sort of realization by a lot of people. But from where I stand, I see so many amazing things that are happening around the world that give me hope, that are bubbling up from so many different places, whether it's fisheries that have been reformed like we did when uh, I was at NOAA. Uh, we've completely turned our fisheries around so that they are a model of sustainability instead of being more and more overfishing. Uh, that's been an incredible success story and it has catalyzed a lot of other countries saying, hey, I want that too. More fish in the ocean, more seafood to catch. Who wouldn't want that? So a lot of other countries are starting to follow suit. Uh, we're seeing local communities uh, do take really active uh, the opportunities to address local pollution issues. Uh, we're seeing more action on climate change, not enough, and perhaps we can talk about that uh, in a little bit. But I'm seeing an increased realization that the ocean is actually so central to our future. It is central to food security uh, because currently over um, three billion people depend on seafood for a significant fraction of their protein. And that's only going to increase in the future as we have less and less land available uh, on for to grow food on land. Uh, so seafood is going to be a key part of food security. Uh, the ocean is actually offers more opportunities for reducing carbon emissions, not just adaptation to climate change, but we just released a new report at the United Nations last week that talked about five different opportunities to reduce carbon emissions from the ocean that people have not really been paying much attention to. And if you add all five of those up, it totals to be a, a, a one-fifth of what we need to get to 1.5 degrees by 2050. So that's actually a really 
hopeful new message that there are some new tools in the toolbox that people haven't thought about. So there, every place we look, it looks as though the ocean is more important than we had appreciated, so much so that instead of thinking that it was uh, too big to fail or now too big to fix, people are realizing it is so immense, so big, and so central to our future that it's too big to ignore. And so we're seeing a change in the narrative about the ocean that hasn't taken on a life of its own yet, but I think is beginning to uh, percolate up. And because the ocean is much more now on the radar screen of the people that are talking about climate, uh, I just came from the, uh, the climate, the climate convention has a series of conference of the parties that make decisions. Those are called the COPs. Uh, a COP that you know about was the the Paris Agreement came out of the uh, COP that was in Paris. The next big COP is going to be in Chile in December. And uh, the pre-COP would just happen or is happening now in Costa Rica. And they're calling it the blue pre-COP and the blue COP because the ocean is now, the ocean agenda is now being merged with the climate agenda in a way that I think is, opens up a lot of new possibilities. So, there's a lot of new bringing together of uh, different threads of the ocean and the climate agenda that I think are uh, actually quite hopeful. And uh, seeing so many powerful things around the, the world. Um, I work with, um, I'm advising 14 heads of state that have said to a group of scientists we want to have a sustainable ocean economy. That's important to our country. Um, help us figure out how to do that. And they want to take leadership and make things happen, and they want their other countries in their regions and the UN to follow their suit. So it's not too often that you have a group of heads of state that are coming to people and saying, tell us what to do. And these are countries, large and small, it's co-chaired by Norway and Palau, but it includes Portugal, uh, Kenya, Namibia, Ghana, Chile, Mexico, Jamaica, Canada, Japan, Indonesia, Fiji, and Australia. I think that's 14. Uh, I had to do it geographically. Uh, but those heads of state are really committed to doing, uh, taking very aggressive action, and they're the ones that commissioned this report on what are the mitigation opportunities. So 14 heads of state saying, we're ready, we're going to make this happen, tell us what to do, we're going to do it. I also uh, am working with the CEOs of the 10 <clears throat> largest seafood companies in the world. These are huge companies. And they have been, uh, frankly, a very large part of the problem. They've been just in it for the money or the whatever currency they have, you know, what, whatever dollar, whatever the currency is. They've been in it for that, uh, and yet they see their future as threatened, especially by climate change. And so they've been willing to have a dialogue with scientists because they now want to work together for more sustainable practices and policies and to work toward addressing climate change. So whether it is heads of state or businesses or faith-based communities, the Pope uh, is very, the, there's a Pontifical Academy of Sciences that advises uh, Pope Francis, and he is very serious about these issues and he wants to move on them. And he didn't have a lot in his encyclical, Laudato Si, about the ocean, but he wants, he's asked for a workshop on the ocean because he wants to learn more about the ocean. So there are a lot of things that are happening that folks might not know of above and beyond the sort of insurgence of young people around the world that are demanding that we address some of these serious issues that I think are actually really, really hopeful. And it's the bringing together of these different threads, uh, the ocean and the climate, but also the uh, justice elements of those are, are really key threads that are now starting to converge. Thank you. I, um, I have a bunch more questions, but I think I'm out of my time. Um, while we've got a few minutes, I wanted to make sure that we gave everybody in the audience a chance to ask questions of your own. Um, so if you have a question for either Jane or Marcia or both of them, um, 
please don't be shy. Jump up and you can go to either microphone here. And if not, I promise I have more, but now's your chance. Thank you very much. Uh, Gordon Aoyagi, class of 1967. Uh, first of all, I commend both of you scientists for achieving one of the highest levels of leadership in, in, uh, in our national policy making, and I think that's great. My question now is really twofold. Uh, we don't hear much about state and local governments, and for science to be effective, where really where rubber hits the road, and I'm, I've been a local government uh, employee for over 30 years, and so I think that's where the action is. But in order, and, and I've been a recipient and use, use a lot of the stuff from the National Science Foundation, so I thank that organization as well. But for local and state governments to be effective, you need a receptive audience. Mm -hmm. What I don't hear much from liberal arts schools or very many of the universities, except for schools of public administration, are career counseling and going to work for local government. Uh, if you had more people with liberal arts educations, people at what I learned at CC, to try to find out what you don't know uh, and to go people who might know, uh, that's when you're going to affect public policy. So I wonder if what we used to do with Teach America when we found the state of our education so poor, would it make sense to have something where you focus upon trying to get more knowledge, science-friendly, graduates of liberal arts schools in state and local governments and try to affect change in that manner. Given the fact that uh, with the uh, Paris Accord disappearing, many states have stepped up to the forefront and said if they won't do it, we will. I see that as the future of our environmental <laughs> survival. Uh, so I, I wonder if you would comment on that. The second is with the loss of all our scientific knowledge at, at many of the state, at many of the federal agencies, and the total glut and loss of good, good bureaucrats who are excellent scientists, how long will it take us to rebuild that knowledge, receptivity, so that we can have informed public policy with hopefully a new administration? Go ahead. <laughs> Okay, I'll um, take your first question, which I think is a good one. Um, I had the uh, opportunity to participate in a panel discussion at the annual meeting of state and local government administrators this past year when they assembled in Washington, D.C. for their annual uh, conference. And the topic of the um, panel was um, how to um, get um, broad-based information um, to people who are in charge of counties, cities, state government, and I was the token scientist on the panel. And it's really clear that when we talk about a federal agency, like Jane's agency or my former agency, um, they, they often have embedded scientists in them, so they're doing fine. But when you get to the state, local, county level cities, they don't have embedded scientists in them. And yet, as you say, they are on the front lines of dealing with all of these issues that require science to make good decisions. So for that reason, a new focus at the National Academies is how do we provide products that are scaled to the needs of counties and states and cities so that they can use them. And then also, how do we build networks for the um, people who are leaders at the county level, at the city level, in states, with, um, with expertise that are at their community colleges, at their state institutions, so that if they have a question, they know who they can call and they know where to go. So I think it's both providing them with information and then also building networks as the solution to the, to the very good problem. So uh, let me add to that. Um, the, uh, there's a professional scientific society uh, that publishes the journal Science, of which Marsha was the editor-in-chief. 
Um, but another thing that AAAS does is to have a program that's called Science and Technology Fellows. And they take students who have PhDs and give them an opportunity to learn how government works and then actually work in government uh, in the federal branch, I mean in the either executive branch or the legislative branch as essentially a, a one to two year internship. And that has been a phenomenal program to get scientists either new knowledge into government or have the, which is just, you know, helping to write bills or advise on certain things that are ongoing and, and uh, at the moment. But a lot of those people have seen from that experience a path into government and have stayed in government service. And that program now has this phenomenal network of scientists across the different federal agencies, but also some that, w that are in members of Congress's offices. Some go back and are active now in their uh, local or state governments. But that program at the national level could, in principle, be replicated at the state level. There's only one state that I know of, California, that has anything similar. Uh, and that is, I think, a really nice model to help, not, not solve all the problems that you were talking about, but to help get people that have really good scientific training and have been uh, you know, shown that they've got good science chops, uh, being civil servants, working for the government, and bringing science into the government. I also think that one of the um, surprising outcomes of um, the 2016 election that uh, really got a lot of scientists uh, very concerned about what was happening to science in this country that's only gotten worse and worse uh, over the intervening years. But one of the outcomes of that was that more and more scientists have been willing to run for offices, local offices, state offices, federal offices, and I think that that uh, is, is also welcome. Uh, it doesn't address all the problems that you're highlighting. Yes, there has been, to your second question, a loss of uh, some really good people from the federal government uh, that are scientists, but there are a number of others that are there, that are hunkered down, that are just sort of um, holding their breaths. And uh, thank goodness that they are there because we need them. They have the intellectual uh, and institutional knowledge and relationships. And, uh, but they are really, really struggling with uh, all of the assaults on science uh, at the federal level right now. And it's really a travesty because they are just the most dedicated civil servants that uh, you know, are, are devoting their lives to doing things that, are, that benefit all of us. And uh, their hands are being tied and they're being muzzled and it's really very, very challenging. Uh, so I think that um, you know we do owe them uh, a, a debt of gratitude, uh, but also some relief, hopefully. Mark, yes, I am Professor Mark Smith, and given that the gentleman who handed Dr. McNutt that Scientific American is sitting ten feet to my right, I think it would be appropriate to recognize Professor Dick Held. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't be the only story in my career that I've heard about Professor Hilt being a wonderful influence on. Uh, the second thing I'd like to say that I've had the pleasure uh, to work with Dr. Uh, Lubchenco once and Dr. Gnut twice, and in both those times you would think that the only thing they had to do was to help uh, CC students. So. Thank you very much. But my question is, um, given your experience trying to communicate the threat of climate change and going back to your comment about swimming to the, with the sharks, dealing with both sharks but just uh, ordinary human beings, what are the messages that work and what is the framing of the message that works to um, compel action on climate change? Yeah. Um, so I think that um, 
typically scientists have sort of jumped into facts and information and sort of you know hit try to beat people over the head with how bad things are and what the challenges are all of which are true but isn't necessarily the approach that uh, is one that is very um, inviting uh, or uh, it enables people to do something about it. And I think some of the things that scientists have learned is the importance of, of images, for example. Um, so this scarf, um, does anybody recognize what this is? It was on the cover of The Last Economist. These are called climate stripes. And from this side, this is 19, 1858, and this side is 19, I mean, 2018. So this is every single year, the global average temperature, every single year from 1858 to 2018. So that is a memorable image, okay? <laughs> the, the message is unmistakable. And so communicating, you know, this, this image, this, this, this was done by um, a climate scientist uh, in England. His name is Ed Hawkins. And he just took all the global data. You can actually go to his website. Uh, if you Google um, climate stripes or warming stripes, uh, and you can get this record for every state in the US and for every country in the world. And it's actually interesting to see how it varies from one to another. So images, I think, are helpful and useful. But uh, a good colleague of mine um, who's a climate scientist, her name is Catherine Hayhoe, is an evangelical Christian. And she has been able to talk to her fellow evangelical Christians about climate change because she doesn't start with all the science but she starts with values and with shared values and finding common ground and talking about the poorest of the people uh, or God's creation uh, or you know children's future and uh, finding common ground and having discussions about climate change that are yes grounded in facts but aren't just focused on the facts but are looking at both um, consequences, but also opportunities. What can we do? And I think it's always challenging to have this dual message of urgency and hope. Because if there isn't the hope that's part of the message, then people tune out. And it's just too daunting. It's too overwhelming. What can I do as a single individual? And we've seen what one young, now 17 or 6, six 17, however old Greta is now, um, you know, we've seen what one young woman has been able to do in terms of galvanizing young people and the rest of uh, many other people in, in many, many places to saying, okay, enough already, let's get things done. So one person can actually do a huge amount, but the, the opportunity for local communities, for states to be taking action, that is a breath of fresh air because even though at the federal level, we're rolling things back. Things are moving along at, by many, many states and by many, many cities. The business models are changing. Renewable energies are, uh, is just taking over this country because it's cheaper. And so once you get uh, the, the scale issues, then things take on a life of their own. So there are many, many hopeful things that are happening, but there is urgency. And this new report that we just saw on the impacts of climate change on the ocean uh, and the ice that just came out uh, last week, two weeks ago, is just incredibly sobering. Uh, the ocean has really borne the brunt of a lot of climate change, and there are massive changes underway. You know, the ocean is higher with sea levels rising. It's stormier, it's warmer, it's more acidic, it has less oxygen, and all of those are very real, tangible problems, and it's only gonna get worse. But it's not hopeless. The other report that we had also released the same time from this high-level panel to build a sustainable ocean economy says, hey, there are things that we can do. And we thought about the ocean as a victim of climate change, 
it actually is a rich source of solutions if we would begin to use them. And so we can do this pivot and this coupling uh, in ways that I think are intellectually honest. It's not giving false promises, but it's not all doom and gloom that has people give up. So how we talk about it, the images that we use, the uh, focusing on finding common ground and on very practical things that people can do. Talking about it is incredibly important. Most people don't talk about climate change because it's so contentious and it's not obvious. But talking about it can lead to solutions. And so talk about it, um, vote for people who are gonna do something about it, uh, vote for people who are gonna pay attention to the science. Uh, I spoke on a panel uh, with, uh, just before Greta spoke last week, or uh, two weeks ago, whenever it was at the UN, I've lost track of time. Uh, and what her remarks were was uh, this, it was, uh, listen to the science, listen to the scientists, <laughs> which was actually, uh, you know, that we, at any rate, there is a lot that can be done, uh, and uh, I think we will get out of this. I think there will be some very serious consequences to people, but we are in this together, and more and more people are realizing that it is a very real problem, and we need action. All the polls are showing that most Americans think that we need to do something about it, and the government isn't doing enough. So I think we are going to reach a tipping point. The sooner we reach that tipping point and start taking serious action, the better it's gonna be for everyone. And I think everybody has a responsibility to help us get to that tipping point. So the only thing I'd add is scientists need to get out of their ghettos. And they need to spend more time with people who think differently than they do, because as Jane says, it's all about shared values. So for example, my husband and I, every summer, go camping uh, up in the Sierras with all, um, a group of people who are from parts of California that are very conservative, very red parts of the state. But because all these people know me and they trust me and they know we share the same values, that when they post stuff on Facebook that is climate denial nonsense, and I write to them, by the way, did you know that science says that this is all bullshit? <laughs> they immediately take it down and they say, oh, Marcia says this is bullshit. So, <laughs> so that's what you need to do. I, I want to be, I apologize, I want to be respectful of people's time. We've pushed past it here. So um, maybe if you have continuing questions for Jane or Marsh and you get a chance to catch them through the festivities of the, of the rest of the weekend, please do that. But for now, please thank both of them for the discussion. All right, if you guys have it. These are my classmates. <laughs> my name's Benita Leahy. I'm a geologist. I'm one of those that got booted out after my master's degree, though, and went tangentially into engineering firms. But in my retirement, I work for several muse museums in the Denver area. So I'm doing education of climate change and the history of the earth and everything to the general public uh, at two museums. And my question to you is there seems to be um, not a basic science education in a lot of people anymore. And I'm talking, you know, you've got the Gretas of the world and you've got some of those, but a great many people um, don't have the basics of science when they come in. And so I'm, I'm sort of where the rubber meets the road here and just any thoughts you might have on that. These are, you know, a lot of inner city kids, that kind of stuff, that don't seem to have the basics of science. So, um, the uh, National Academies put out um, the Next Generation Science Standards, which um, I believe are very strong because they are inquiry-based standards where students are encouraged to learn by doing so that they understand that science isn't a series of facts, but it's a way of knowing about the earth so that, or about the natural world, that we can all be scientists because we can experiment and figure things out for ourselves. It's not something that's handed to us, it's something that we know because we can confirm it. And um, uh, now 17 states have adopted these standards and they are, con they are converting these standards into actual curriculum. So I am actually 
uh, optimistic for the future, but it's been a long road. Thank you both so much for your time today. We really appreciate you. it.